just one of many in their lifetimes. And they're feeling the pressure. It is one of the worst feelings in the world. American students take more than 100 million standardized tests a year. You start to panic. You start doubting yourself. But no matter how smart you are, sometimes even the brightest brains don't perform as they should. My stomach flips, and then I feel really sad. They choke under pressure. I yeah. usually freak out. <laughs> yeah. And it's not just in the classroom. I think anyone can choke under pressure. We've all seen it happen. From American Idol... Remember everything that I told you. That's ironic. To a spelling bee. I-N-S-I. All the great chokes have something in common. They've all failed to perform up to their best when the pressure is high. Rick Perry in the Republican debates of 2011. And the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> and, of course, the sports choke. Like going for a crucial field goal that should be easy and missing. Whether you're an athlete or just a kid sitting for the SAT, Choking can be devastating. It's one thing to have skill or the knowledge to perform well, but it doesn't matter how much math you know if you can never show it on the quantitative section of the SAT. But what if you could teach your brain not to choke? That's the goal of cognitive scientist Sian Bylock. Sian is figuring out how to train your brain to perform at its best even when the heat is on. Sion learned about choking the hard way. Soccer, I think, was my one really true passion. My name is Sion Bailak, and I'm a soccer goalkeeper. At 16, she was a star goalie in the Olympic Development Program. Then, one day, a national coach came to see her play. I knew he was there, and I knew that this might be my one shot. An offensive player came down the right side of the field and uh, took a shot at the near post, which is the post you're supposed to be able to save the ball from. And it went right under my arm and in the goal. It went all downhill from there. And that was it. I, I was out of consideration for the national team that year. You know, I had that one shot, and I failed. It was a crushing blow. I just felt totally defeated. All the hard work I'd put into getting to the place that I was getting had just vanished in the blink of an eye. It was the middle of the game and I wanted to walk off the field. So yeah, I choked. Soon after, Sian walked away from soccer. But when she went to college, she was determined to find out what had happened inside her brain on that fateful day. So she majored in cognitive science. One of the reasons I was really interested in cognitive science is that it seemed like it might be a window into trying to understand a little bit about how I performed. So people always ask me if I do me-search, right? And I think there's definitely a little bit of me-search to what I do. Sian wants to know what happens to our brain under pressure. And her research team has figured out the perfect recipe for high anxiety. What we do is we have these students come in and they, they do a block of math problems. They even make the math problems look strange to throw the students off. And then we give them a series of instructions that are really designed to create a very stressful environment for them. They put money on the line and tell the students that a partner is depending on them to improve their score. But if you can't improve, then you won't get this additional money and either way your partner. At this point, the students are really freaking out. And then, but to really make it a very, very stressful environment, we bring out a video camera and we put it right next to them. Do you see a red light? Then the students do a second block of problems. And it works. Most people, when they're in our stressful situations, really do feel pressure to perform at a high level. And as it happens, lots of people choke under that pressure. Usually they, they choke about 11 to 12 percent below their initial block of problems. So what's happening when they choke? Only the scanner can tell. We put people in this MRI machine. They're lying on their back, but they can see a computer screen, and they're actually performing problems. They use a controller to give their answers. Then Sian's team makes them sweat. 
Finally, during this next set of problems, we're going to be videotaping your performance. Sion's theory was that these stressors were messing with the patient's working memory. It's a little different from short-term memory, which comes from the hippocampus. Working memory is your mental scratch pad that essentially allows you to work with whatever information is held in consciousness. And it involves the prefrontal cortex, which is part of the frontal lobe just above our eyes. Our prefrontal cortex essentially allows us to do all those special things we can do as humans, whether it's hitting a tiny ball into a tiny hole or juggling lots of math problems in our head. Based on activity she saw in the scans of her stressed out subjects, Sion can infer communication between the prefrontal cortex and the emotional centers of the brain, like the amygdala. And when the emotional centers are overactive, they can prevent clear thinking. In these situations when people fail, these worries tend to come online and co-opt those prefrontal resources that people would otherwise use to perform well. Sion's preliminary data suggests that in a choker's brain, the emotions cause a racket big enough to interrupt working memory. But what about those lucky people who don't choke, who perform well under pressure? What's different about a non-choker's brain? It's almost as if the prefrontal cortex and those emotion centers of the brain uncouple or stop talking for a moment. For non-chokers, it's almost as though they temporarily put the conversation between these two parts of the brain on hold. People who are less likely to choke essentially show less crosstalk. There's less of an opportunity for these worries to seep in and impact performance. And we think that these are skills that can be taught. High stakes in the class. Sion had a theory she thought could have a huge impact and she set out to prove it. She went where the stress was boiling over, a high school biology exam. Just before the test started, Sion's team gave the kids an extra assignment. We uh, came into the classrooms and asked all the students to either write about their deepest thoughts and feelings or sit there for 10 minutes. Sion knew from other studies that depressed patients who wrote down their emotions in a journal could break the cycle of negative thinking. But would it work for anxious test takers? And the idea is that if we have people journal before this important test, we might be able to help them succeed. The students poured out their deepest worries onto paper. Then it was test time. So how'd they do? Students who just sat without writing anything, on average, got a B minus. But the ones who wrote got, on average, a B plus. We boosted these students' scores over a half a grade point by just having them sit and write for 10 minutes about their thoughts and feelings about the upcoming high-stakes test. So what did the students write? There's a millions of butterflies in my stomach. Breathe, breathe, I'm telling myself. So he starts out talking about how worried he is, and then towards the middle, he says, as I continue to think about this final, I relax significantly. For those students with high test anxiety, journaling was a silver bullet. But why does it work? When people are worrying up under stress, it's almost like a computer with too many programs open at once. Sometimes everything crashes. And by writing down some of those worries, you're able to offload some of those programs so you free up resources to perform at your best. Journaling may help kids show how smart they are when it matters most. You don't have to be an Olympic athlete or sitting for the SAT to have these choking experiences. Whether you're interviewing for a job or just one of my favorite places where I often choke parallel parking in front of your spouse, some of the same processes can drive that underperformance. What my work shows is that it doesn't have to be an inevitable phenomenon and that we can learn from those poor performances. And what if she'd never choked? I've thought about this idea. Maybe if I hadn't choked in front of the national coach, I would have gone on to play in the Olympics. But I'm happy with all the lessons I learned from that experience, and I think I've been able to, to take some of them and use them in my new life pursuits. I want my work to really push the bounds of what we're able to do so that everyone can perform up to their potential. And Sion practices what she preaches. She journaled before this interview. So what did she write? So I wrote, what a day. I'm exhausted, and I hope that doesn't make me sound incoherent. I need to just focus on the present on today and have fun with it and not let my thoughts or worries about tomorrow or the next day seep in. And did it help? <laughs> sure, did I ace my interview? 
Danielle. <laughs>